Hello and good afternoon. My name is Anna Pham Short and today I will be speaking to you about nutrition, insulin, daily physical activity and competitive sports. I'm currently a senior diabetes dietitian at the Children's Hospital at Westmead in Sydney, Australia. Today I will be, will be speaking to you about the benefits of physical activity, the barriers to exercise in type 1 diabetes, balancing the physical activity and the optimal glycemic control, as well as optimising performance with nutrition and insulin in type 1 diabetes. As we are all well aware, there are many benefits to physical activity for children and young people. This includes building confidence and social skills, developing their coordination, improving their concentration and learning, strengthening their muscles and bones, improving their health fitness, maintaining a healthy weight and improving sleep. The recommendations generally worldwide is to aim for at least 60 minutes a day. And this can be done from a, a variety of different activities and spread throughout the day. It can include play, running, walking, swimming, skating, skipping, riding a bike, playing sports, dancing and doing workouts. Generally, the message is to sit less and move more. We want them to put the screens down. The ISPAD recommendations also recommend that children between the ages of 6 to 18 years should do at least 60 minutes of physical activity a day. It should include moderate to vigorous physical activity at least three times a week, muscle strengthening as well as bone strengthening activities. The other thing I want you to note is that about 30% of children with type 1 diabetes are also overweight or obese. And so hence these recommendations for regular physical activity also become very important. The benefits of exercise in type 1 diabetes include all those that I mentioned in the previous slide, however, also extends to improved glycemic sensi sorry, improved insulin sensitivity, reduced cardiovascular risk, improved psychological well-being, as well as improved HbA1c. The reported barriers for those with type 1 diabetes includes the too many options, the intensities vary, the durations vary, and it has differing and unpredictable effects on their blood glucose levels. But primarily, the main concern um, is that there is a fear of hypoglycemia. Youth with type 1 diabetes have similar or higher rates of um, overweight and obesity compared to the general population. The other thing to note is that youth with type 1 diabetes have been reported to be less fit than their non-diabetic peers, particularly if their glycemic control is very poor. Nonetheless, we as healthcare professionals can still inspire them to reach their activity and their competitive goals. I've had patients when they're newly diagnosed, I'm sure as you would have had as well, where their goals were to be a wonderful soccer player or a wonderful cricket player, and our role is to encourage them to hang on to those goals, and we know that they still can and that we can work together to help them reach their goals. Here are a few people that um, have type 1 diabetes that have excelled in their professions as, as, as athletes. Here there is Sir Stephen Redgrave, who is a five times Olympic gold winner for rowing. There is Zipporah Cars, who was a soloist ballerina with the New York Ballet Company. And she was actually diagnosed with diabetes in her prime um, while she was with the company and then still managed to be a beautiful ballerina and become a soloist and one of their principal ballerinas. There is Team Novo, which is an all-professional cycling team where every member on the team has type 1 diabetes. Um, they have also, they are currently the holders of the Race Around America um, title. There is Gary Hall, who is a five-time Olympic gold swimmer, as well as Lauren Cox, to name a few, a professional American basketball player who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was quite young, I think about seven. So, you know, these are wonderful leaders and influential and inspiring people to, um, who have type 1 diabetes and we can use them as, as role models to encourage our patients. So what actually happens? What's the exercise physiology during exercise? So for a child who doesn't have type 1 diabetes, during ex exercise there is an increase, sorry, a decreased secretion in insulin, which leads to an increase in the counter-regulatory hormones. This then means that there's an increased liver glucose production, which matches the skeletal muscle uptake. So however much they need is matched quite nicely. And this is a relatively well controlled and refined system, which means that they have relative, they have rather stable blood glucose levels under most exercise conditions. For a child with diabetes, as we know, their body doesn't secrete any insulin. We're giving it via injection, injections exogenously. Um, and what this means is that it can impair their glucose counter-regulation. 
which then means that they have variable blood glucose levels. The uptake in the muscles is quite variable. They can experience hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia during or soon after exercise. The other thing to be mindful of is that the impact of the type of exercise and its impact on the blood glucose levels. So these intensive exercises tend to cause blood glucose levels to trend up. They are things like anaerobic activities such as sprints, weightlifting, um, and then you get a mixture of aerobic and anaerobic such as basketball. Um, and these aerobic activities tend to reduce the blood glucose levels. So they're activities such as cycling, swimming and running. Um, and the longer the activity, the more prolonged the effect. Usually aerobic exercise activities are the ones where we would normally say they're a little bit more out of breath. Studies have shown that children with type 1 diabetes who have optimal glycemic control, so their HbA1c is less than 53 millimoles per mole, perform equally to their non-diabetic controls. There have been reports of higher rates of fatigue and lower aerobic capacity when glycemic control is suboptimal. So the message here is optimising their glycemic control thus aids their optimal performance. So what about sports nutrition? What can we do about the foods that we recommend? The things that we have to ask our patients and their families before we actually start with our recommendations are what is your individual goal? Is it about building muscle mass? Do they want to look like Superman? Is it about weight? Do they want to be quite slim? Um, is it about fitness and they want to be able to run for longer? Um, we've had, I've had quite a few patients who um, they engage in exercise purely just to bring their blood glucose levels down. So it's a way of managing their blood glucose levels. Or is it that they want to participate in competitive sports? Is their goal to achieve and maintain a certain sports physique? What is their weight goal? Is it about improving fitness? And what are the goals of the sport? What does the sport actually need them to do? The goals of the sport, so is it about strength? Is it about the fact that they need more power? Do they need to be able to play baseball and hit the ball really strong? Is it about weightlifting or shot put? Is it about speed? Is it a combination of strength and endurance? Is it swimming, tennis, soccer um, and endurance? Is it about staying power and running marathons? Because all of these different sports activities and their different demands will actually place different um, nutritional recommendations. So the food that you recommend to someone or the food requirements are actually needed for growth first because we're generally talking about young people who are still growing and then on top of that you add in the sports demands and then you adjust the insulin um, from then on. As an example Michael Phelps who doesn't have type 1 diabetes but he's a swimmer as we all probably know from a few Olympics um, he participated in a few Olympics he won 22 medals of which 18 is gold was gold and he was famed to eat 12,000 calories a day. What does this look like? So for example, for his breakfast while he was training would be three fried egg sandwiches with cheese, lettuce, tomatoes, fried onions, and mayonnaise, two coffees, a five egg omelet, a bowl of porridge, three slices of French toast with powdered sugar, as well as three chocolate chip pancakes. So for breakfast alone, this is what it looked like. This is an extraordinary amount of food. I'm sure none of us here would say that Michael Phelps was overweight in any way, shape or form, but it's purely what his body needed to help him perform um, to the best of his capacities. The carbohydrate recommendations for sports and diabetes. Carbohydrates are actually the body's main source of fuel for exercise. The requirements vary widely depending on the demands of the exercise. The carbohydrates may be needed during exercise. This could be for performance for hypoglycemia prevention or for both. The aim of um, our recommendations is that we ask them to distribute the food across the whole day, distributing carbs and protein over the day to fuel the body and match those exercise and recovery periods. This here is a table for the nutrient distribution before, during and after exercise for glycemic control. Um, as we said, it's about diabetes and then the sports layer on top. So for carbohydrate requirements three to four hours prior to the exercise, it is a generally healthy, low fat, um, whole grain, low GI meal as part of a mixed meal. Immediately prior to the exercise, check their blood glucose levels if it's low and indicated to have 10 to 15 grams of carbs. During the exercise, um, 10 to 15 grams of carbs per 30 minutes for aerobic or longer duration activities. Um, and that depends on how much insulin is on board and what their blood glucose levels are, how long ago was their last injection. Generally, it's not needed for anaerobic or competitive short duration exercises unless their blood glucose levels are low. Um, 
Immediately post-exercise, if it's eaten within, if a meal is consumed within an hour of activity, they generally don't need um, to eat. If a meal is after an hour, you may need 10 to 15 grams of carbs, for example, fruit, low-fat cereal bar or um, a small glass of milk. One to two hours post-exercise, again, a healthy, low-fat, whole grain, low GI meal, um, carb, sorry, as part of a mixed meal. And for exercise activities, before sleep, so that late afternoon, early evening sort of activities, um, we would recommend that you have an additional bedtime snack. There are no real increased protein requirements for exercise as a part of glycemic control. And we generally want them to stay quite well hydrated. We don't want them to be dehydrated during their activity levels, uh, activities. The other thing with diabetes and particularly around exercise is that we do require or we recommend lots of frequent blood glucose monitoring. So immediately prior to exercise, before they're about to run out on the field, we want to check their levels. If they are less than 90 milligrams per deciliter, we ask that they delay exercise until the blood glucose levels come up above five. Um, to be mindful here is if it's a school activity, it takes them a while to come back up quite, and they may miss the sporting activity. So problem solve that with them the next time they come in and see you. A blood glucose level between 90 to 124 milligrams, we recommend ingesting 10 to 20 grams of carbs before starting aerobic exercise, so your soccer, your dancing. Um, 126 to 180 grams of carbs, uh, sorry, milligrams per deciliter, no carbs are needed. Um, aerobic and anaerobic exercise can be started. Blood glucose level a little bit higher, between 182 to 252 milligrams per deciliter. Again, they can start exercise. The thing to be mindful of here is if their glucose levels are quite high, um, above 252, um, check for ketones. And if they have ketones, we ask that they do not do any exercise because um, it's contraindicated. We don't want them to get any sicker. We would encourage that they continue to closely monitor their, their high um, blood glucose levels in case they're having hypos. If they're busy running around playing and exercising, they may not pick up on their symptoms. So it's important to test if you can or if you have CGM. Um, this here is the carbohydrate and energy requirements for regular physical activity. So for normal daily um, activity, it's a school day, they walk to school, to and from, they play with their friends during the, the lunch break, it's a normal day. Um, what we recommend is 45 to 50% of their total energy intake coming from carbohydrates. And the way you calculate this is that dietitians would often use um, the Schofield's equation to figure out, um, based upon their ideal body weight, how many um, kilojoules or calories they need in a day, calculate that as about 45 to 50% of carbs and then give them a carbohydrate amount recommendation. Um, exercise snacks according to blood glucose levels and then you adjust the insulin for blood glucose level management. If their goal is for weight loss, we make sure that they still get enough for growth and just general maintenance. We generally don't increase the carbohydrates throughout the day. There can be nothing more frustrating than someone who is trying to lose weight and they're having lots of hypos and you keep saying to them, well, you've got to eat another 20 to 30 grams of carbs before you run out and do exercise. Oh, you've gone low after exercise. Here, have some more carbs. It can become quite infuriating and quite um, discouraging. So in those cases, we would generally recommend a reduction in insulin to prevent those those hypos if we're aiming for weight loss. If it's training, if it's for performance, um, depending on the type of activity, which I will touch on a little bit later as well, um, the carbohydrate requirements generally are a little bit higher, so 50 to 55 percent is um, carbohydrates, to en and ensure that you meet the energy demands for their growth as well as the demands of the sports on top, so your Michael Phelps for example. Um, we want the insulin adjustment to be around managing their blood glucose levels for fuel utilisation. We want them to be able to use all that extra carbs that they've got on board. Again, like I said, important to distribute the food across the whole day to fuel the body. Um, and the other thing to be mindful of here is that higher fat, higher protein meals tend to increase blood glucose levels up to five to six hours um, afterwards, as the literature has shown. So what you may say, what you may suggest to families is to consider a larger protein amount at dinner to prevent those overnight hypos. So on those particular nights, maybe having a little bit more cheese, a little bit more egg, or a little bit more fish, not to give any, and not to give any extra insulin for it, and then to prevent the hypos later on at night. And then what about um, the amount of insulin just prior to exercise? 
So depending on the, the activity that they've got, it's continuous, moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise, such as jogging, running, um, moderate intensity swimming, bicycling, cross country, aerobic play, perhaps dancing. If the activity lasts for 30 to 45 minutes, the meal immediately prior to exercise, we would recommend a 25 to 50% bolus reduction. As the activity is a bit longer, greater than 45 minutes, then it's a 50 to 75% bolus reduction. And then the meal after exercise, still having the same amount of food that they normally would do, but give about 50% less insulin than they normally would. So these are your options. If it's a mixed aerobic and anaerobic burst activity, such as hopping, skimming, dance, gymnastics, tag, field sports, so there's a little bit of a short burst of movement, and stop, short burst, and then they stop again. Um, uh, if the activity lasts between 30 to 45 minutes, uh, about 25% bolus reduction. Activities lasting longer than 45 minutes, about a 50% bolus reduction. And again, for the meal afterwards, considering up to half the amount of insulin that they would need for that meal. This is primarily for hypo. Um, prevention. The other thing to be mindful of here, if it's anaerobic exercise um, or fuel is needed for performance, then you may not need to do uh, reduction in insulin or slightly less reductions. For those on pumps, consider a temp basal rate starting 30 to 60 minutes before the activity or disconnect the pump, particularly if it's contact sports. Um, and considering a decrease in the background insulin for very strenuous exercise. So if they've been active all day, they've had um, games and training, games and training, they've been active for four or five hours or longer periods of time, then we would normally recommend a reduction in the background insulin as well to manage that. So post-exercise meal. So um, the post-exercise meal, the meal is generally after the activity, should incorporate carbohydrates and protein because this prevents hypoglycemia as well as improving muscle recovery. Generally after exercise, insulin sensitivity remains quite high um, for hours post-activity and early replenishment of the glycogen stores helps reduce the risk of a hypo later on. Adding the protein to this meal then stimulates muscle recovery post-exercise. To maximise recovery, the recommended um, ratio in the literature is 4 to 1 or 3 to 1 grams of carbs to every 1 gram of protein. So what does this look like? So your food options may be things such as um, a slice of bread with a piece of cheese. So the carbohydrates there are 15 to about 5 grams of protein. So the carbohydrate to protein ratio there is 3 glass of milk to banana. Milk is actually quite a good um, option as a recovery food. So that there is 32 to 8.8 .8 grams with a ratio of 3.6. Something like peanut butter on toast or a nut butter on toast, a slice and a tablespoon, um, 17 to 4, 4.2. Or maybe just trying a few, um, having a look to see what's available and perhaps there's some flavored meal poppers that um, are available um, in the shops close to you. Um, and looking for that magic three to four ratio of carbs to protein. So the things to consider before you start offering any nutritional advice um, is to consider what type of exercise is it? Is it going to be a tennis game? Is it going to be weightlifting? How long is this exercise going to be and how intense are they? Are they the sort of child that is going to be running around all day and they're not going to stop on the soccer field? Or are they that little five-year-old girl that's just going to stand there and look at the clouds and, and not pay attention to the fact that there are children running around behind them? The timing of the exercise in relation to the day and the meal. So if it's a meal um, later in the day, then you've got to consider the possibility of delayed hypos overnight. So reducing the nighttime insulin or the basal rates, um, adjusting the dinner meals, for example, how much insulin is on board whether there were adjustments made. And the very important thing here is to be mindful of their previous experience with exercise. So what tends to work for child A may be completely different to child B. They may have very individual responses to the same activity, such as soccer, for example. So over the years, I've had families where they would say to me, when you play soccer, I need his levels to be between blah and blah. If it's a 30 minute game, this is what I need to do. If it's a one hour game, this is what I do. Perks exercise, this is what I do, da, da, da. And they, because they are so invested in the, the performance of their child for that activity, they may have had it worked out beautifully. So, yeah, great, does that work? Perfect, great. So it's always important to be mindful of their experiences as well. And the literature does say that everyone's um, experiences with their blood glucose levels to exercise is, is rather individual, but this is pretty much a general good base to start off with. 
So what are some scenarios that you may face? Um, you, they may be experiencing hypoglycemia after sports. This increased risk is due to the body replenishing those glycogen stores and it's needing to pay back what has been lost and what you've used during exercise. Resistance exercise before aerobic is protective. So what I mean by this is a quick 10 second sprint will tend to increase blood glucose levels and it can increase with um, reducing the risk of hypos. The post-exercise meal should be consumed within an hour about 15 to 30 grams of carbs with no extra insulin because our goal here is to prevent hypoglycemia. Scenario two, what about when they didn't reduce the insulin? You've given them all these recommendations and they didn't do it and it probably may be because they are at home and their friend has come up on the bicycle and said, hey, Bob, let's go for a quick bike ride. Um, it's spontaneous, you want your child to go. So for short um, 30 to one hour sort of activities, or more prolonged exercise, we recommend consuming 15 to 30 grams of carbs per 30 minutes of exercise. Um, and considering carbs that have a higher GI because it's going to work a little bit faster. So your white prints, for example. What about if they've got high blood glucose levels? So stress or adrenaline will increase the blood glucose. Um, and what we recommend here is to only use half a correction for a high BG after exercise. So if they've come off the field and the pump is suggesting that they need four units of insulin, we'd recommend half, so give only two. Um, the blood glucose levels will eventually start to drop, but you may not see that drop until one to two hours after exercise. So in summary, the nutrition advice that you would give to people with type 1 diabetes performing regular exercise should always be individualised. Have a nice conversation to them about what their previous experiences are, what their goals are, um, and what has happened to them in the past. Ensure that you meet the nutritional demands for their growth, and then as well as the nutritional demands of the sport. Um, always include the management of glycemia, because as I've mentioned before, if they've got optimal glycemic control, that it tends to improve their performance. And then with these um, suggestions in mind, create a meal and then adjust the insulin accordingly. Um, always ensure they have adequate hydration. And before they come in to see you, suggest that they keep these detailed records of their physical activity, their insulin, the food and glucose levels, because this can then help guide your clinical advice. And if they are really interested in performing to the best of their ability in the sports, um, this is probably something they're quite motivated to do. They wanna know what's been happening. Um, and how can we improve their performance? And quite often they will have coaches um, that may be involved and also quite interested in their um, capacities and capabilities. Uh, optimizing glycemia and then meet the demands of the sports nutrition on top. So they're the two sort of goals that you've got in mind. Exercise, as we know, is important for all children, particularly those with type 1 diabetes. We should aim for at least an hour a day. If they're exercising in the afternoon or in the evening, or if exercise is new, if it's a new activity that they've just started, then we definitely recommend more frequent blood glucose checks as well as some overnight checks because hypos can happen up to 16, 24 hours after the activity. If their severe hypo has occurred in the last 24 hours prior to exercise, we recommend that they don't exercise because this again increases their chance of another hypo, which is not what we want. And as I'd mentioned, consider involving the sports coach, have a chat to them, you know, what would you recommend to a child that doesn't have diabetes um, in terms of food, nutrition, performance or training, and then we can adapt that to the diabetes as well. Some of the re resources that are available, there is a website here called Run Sweet, um, and it provides uh, advice for individual various sports up here where it's got diabetes and sport. Some of the activities are include tennis, martial arts, swimming and hiking. So it's a, some of the expected um, reactions that you will get with blood glucose levels, whether it's increased risk of hypos or hypers, um, and some dietary guidance along there as well. So that's quite tailored because as you can imagine, lots of different exercises have different recommendations. A lot of my talk today has been based on the ISPAD clinical practice consensus guidelines for exercise management, as well as the Riddell paper on exercise management in type 1 diabetes, which is pretty much a JDRF um, paper as well. So thank you very much for listening to me this afternoon about sports nutrition and um, type 1 diabetes. I hope there were a few things that you found quite relevant and you can take back to your patients um, to optimise their glycemic control, their sports performance and their clinical care. Thank you very much.